the digital security threat, uh, you know, that was first brought into light in our community uh, by Tibet Action Institute with the, the WeChat campaign. Uh, the goal of the organization is basically kind of like to use technology and strategic nonviolence for the freedom of Tibet uh, in one line. And so I think what we do as an organization is we look at like, uh, how do we, uh, from my work perspective, which is on digital security is looking at a few different aspects. So one of the major components of that is looking at uh, the targeted attacks, the email threats that the community faces, and how do you combat that? So for example, if an organization's website is being compromised, how did that happen? How do you, uh, how do you remedy that? And if there's a lot of email based attacks, how do you remedy that? Uh, who's doing that? Uh, are we able to work with global researchers to understand how these threats are happening? And being able to understand these threats, can we provide a solution for the community that is not only specific for one organization, but for the community wide? So that is part of the digital security aspect of it. Uh, the second part is how can we work collaboratively? And I think that is uh, part of like uh, the work that we do, I think is focusing on how can we work together so the TIPSERT framework that we have is actually part of that concept. It's like, how can the community get together and work together so that we can understand the threats better and also at the same time provide solutions and like uh, that actually work for the community. So I think that's part of the whole like uh, working together concept. Uh, the other part is like uh, that we do is like work, uh, look at like what's happening inside Tibet. So whether it's like the censorship that's happening inside Tibet, like the WeChat censorship. So working with Citizen Lab and others to understand how WeChat is being censored inside Tibet as compared to how it is a bit more open, if you if you want to say the word uh, globally. And also kind of understand what websites are blocked inside Tibet. What are the different websites that are being censored by the Chinese government? So I think that's part of it. So we that's one aspect of the work. And the final aspect is uh, I think which is a bit more advocacy related, especially I'm just talking about the tech perspective. Uh, I'm not talking about the strategic nonviolence, uh, which is looking at technology companies, right? Uh, that can be Chinese or global. So for example, we had a campaign against Google where when Google was about to launch Project Dragonfly, which is a censored search engine in China, they wanted to do something. So we had an advocacy, advocacy campaign to try to stop that. And we were successful in doing that because not only, it wasn't only us, there was a lot of... Uh, employees at Google who also didn't want that. So right now we actually have a campaign against Apple because of Apple censorship in Tibet uh, and Tibet, uh, and Uyghurs, uh, for Uyghurs and common Chinese citizens, right? Where Apple censors a lot of these different uh, VPN applications, Tibetan apps, stuff like that. So I think those are the different components of the work that uh, we do at Tibet Action. Now about the recognition. So you know, in a recent interview, uh, you said, uh, you know, through this recognition, uh, yeah. the issue of digital security threats faced by Tibetan inside Tibet and diaspora is highlighted, right? Yes. So that's that's something that you said, and you know, I I thought that that's really really powerful in that you know this is your passion, right? So yeah. uh, I am I'm wondering um, what is what is um, the value of this recognition and uh, you know how does it um, sort of uh, enhances the work of Tibet Action Institute? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, on a personal front uh, the, the recognition was uh, very like I had it was uh, I think all right like uh, so the recognition from like why it's saying that like uh, the work that I do and we do at Tibet Action Institute in some ways is like kind of like an innovation, right? I think that was a lot of, uh, I think that was very, uh, I guess all of us are really happy about that because I think we knew in our own way that like the work that we do is innovative because if you look at like, uh, I think to kind of explain how this is, is like uh, when people used to talk about digital security, it used to be about tools. It used to be about what tools do you use? What antivirus do we use, right? And our kind of strategy at Tibet Action, like from the get-go was focus on how can you make sure that the person behind the computer, the user is empowered. So it wasn't about like this tool or that tool. It was about empowering the user. And it was about like best practices. It was about digital hygiene. It was like kind of, I think the campaign that we had was 
be your own cyber superhero. So I think there are certain aspects of that, even though there are certain things that um, where you might need tools, but at the end of the day, it's the human behind the computer that's actually the most important part of digital security. So I think this is a concept that we actually brought into the community, right? I'm not talking only about the Tibetan community. I'm talking about the global community, like the global internet freedom community or the digital security community, uh, the where our kind of structure and uh, where we actually did the trainings was focused on community specific and also uh, came from a perspective of the user first rather than the technology first. So I think that was something that wasn't really seen for a very long time. However, if you look at like any other like uh, group right now, everyone actually does that. So I, I can't say that we were the first ones to start it, but I think we were one of the first groups to actually start that. And the reason being, we Tibetans have been targeted for more than a decade, right? We have been targeted with email attacks and targeted emails for like almost two decades. So I think we actually had the experience. So we came out with solutions. I think that everyone is, else is doing right now. So whether we can say that we were the pioneers of that, I think maybe we were part of the pioneering group. So I think that's one of it. Uh, the second part where I think, as I was talking about, where it highlights the Tibetan issue is the fact that when we talk about digital security, I think it is very important to understand that Tibetans have been at the forefront of this for a very long time. People didn't know about targeted email attacks. Uh, like in the last, maybe people started, uh, like other communities started talking about that in the last 10 years. We've been doing it for almost two decades. So I think we have been at the forefront and we have had solutions that, that we kind of like figured out and show to the rest of the world. So I think being nominated and being kind of part of this list uh, actually shows the work that the community has done towards that. So I think that's an important aspect of like, not only the work that Tibet Action has done, but the work that the Tibetan community and the diaspora has actually done towards digital security for almost two decades. And I think uh, even though right now we are the ones doing it, I think there were other individuals, whether they were at the CTA, whether they were in uh, different NGO groups who have actually done some work towards digital security. So I think that was just kind of a recognition of that fact, I think. Uh, I'm sure. Um, well, that's great. Um, you know, uh, picking up on that same uh, question, actually, so, you know, it is, there is no doubt that there is a real threat against the Tibetan community from People's Republic of China. For example, just in 2020, we have had three spies arrested from among ourselves, right? So, so uh, I'm actually wondering, you know, with Tibet Action Institute, are you working towards that end to curve this kind of espionage and like, uh, uh, you know, spreading disinformation and stuff like that? Thank you. So, yeah. So I think Karen, as you pointed out, I think that's a very poignant question, right? I think like we had like three different spies that were like kind of like in the public domain in the last, in 2020 from China. So the question does remain, right? Like we have had those three and there was a lot of like uh, interest in the Tibetan community and a fear, right? However, I think we have to understand that what were these spies doing, right? They were trying to get information about what's happening in exile. They were trying to figure out who's connected to whom. But if they, if someone's really compromised your computer, that person's, uh, the it's already done. So for example, if you have a Tibetan leader whose computer is compromised by, by an email or a targeted email, right? So the thing, thing about that is like, he has access to your computer. He knows who you're talking to. He has information about you. So that's basically a spy work, right? So I think we really need to figure out that in 2020, in 2021, and in the coming years, we are going to get more uh, spies on our computers. And I think we need to understand that like we, even though we are like talking about like being secure in terms of our physical space and like being protected from these spies, I think we really need to understand that on the technology side, on our computers, on our networks, on our, in our organizations, we really need to understand that this same thing is happening. And it's probably even worse because we don't see that. And because it's, it's, on, a, it's on a computer or a device, our fear is less. So I think we need to understand that. And one thing that I usually say, right, uh, about this whole thing is like when we use WeChat, and I think it, because it does come back into the, the space of using a Chinese application, right? So if you look at WeChat, uh, I understand if you're a Tibetan who was born in Tibet, who has to communicate with your family and friends inside Tibet, 
for personal reasons on WeChat. And that's something that like we need to do. And I think as somebody born in exile who doesn't really have a lot of relationships inside Tibet, uh, like in the sense of like, relatives, I can't understand that. And I can't tell somebody not to use WeChat. However, if you're a Tibetan uh, using WeChat primarily to communicate with Tibetans in exile, to talk about politics, talk about issue, different issues, I think you're giving information to China. And when you say that like uh, there's a spy coming to get information about Tibet, uh, what we are doing, you're already doing that on WeChat. So what's the difference? So that's where I kind of like kind of understand that when we talk about spies, physical spies, we do get uh, scared. We do talk about how important it is to understand that. But when it come in, comes into the digital space, we kind of assume that it's not as important. So I think that's where we need to change. It is as important of what you do online as you do on in the physical space, right? So yeah. That's actually a great point, you know, a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, you know, and uh, like even today we have, we tend to have a resistance towards not using WeChat, right? <laughs> no, no, uh, definitely. And then like terrible, and as, as I was saying, right, I, I completely understand if you're using WeChat to talk to your family and stuff inside Tibet, because you have to, and that's part of who you are, and that's your family, and you have to. But if you are just using it to talk within the exile community, talking about different aspects right and like and all of us do know that wechat before like it was banned in india was the primary source of communication tool that everyone was using and that was not to talk to tibetans inside tibet that was not to talk to tibetans inside tibet about what's happening inside tibet it was used to talk among ourselves about politics religion social issues everything right and why do we need to do that so i think that's a, that's the question Absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, speaking of, uh, you know, apps and technology, um, so the next big race, the next big, uh, you know, uh, uh, technology is the 5G. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, I was uh, looking through uh, Citizen Labs, uh, you know, website yes. and the kind of work that they're doing. They, they seem to be very much against uh, you know, uh, Canada's uh, relationship with Huawei right now. And in fact, you know, in a, in a uh, statement, they actually say that, you know, citizen, uh, uh, Canada's heavy dependency on Huawei is not going to solve Canada's 5G problems. Instead, yes. a robust and vendor neutral approach is required. So, how are you know where are we in terms of 5g how is america doing and um, you know what's 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 the news in that world okay so i think like with the 5g i think uh, the report that you mentioned it was uh, uh, it's actually a really interesting report uh this i think it was released like maybe a few days ago and it is actually a very nuanced report and i think that's something that i really kind of like appreciate the work that citizen lab does even though like uh, even though from uh, from the context you might seem like see it as like uh, them writing about how Huawei is actually not good for the Canadian government and like whether the 5G should or should not be used. Uh, if you go through the report, it actually talks about how what is the issues right now in Canada, and I think there are similar issues in the U.S. Right, uh, because like it's it's talking about like it's not only about Huawei; it is about uh, relying on one technology or one company. So whether it's Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, which are three of the largest like uh, 5G uh, techno kind of like uh, technology companies who can actually build uh, 5Gs, uh, 5G technologies. And I think that is a challenge because Huawei actually does it better. Uh, they, do, they do it, I don't know whether, uh, sorry, not to say better, but they do it cheaper. They are one of the cheapest like 5G technology. So for example, if you're a country which wants to use 5G, uh, Huawei is probably one of the best options because it is cheaper and it, they can build everything. So I think that's one component. They can build from the routers, the chipset, everything. Everything you need to set up 5G in your, uh, in your country, uh, whether it's mobile, whether it's like chips, whether it's like the, uh, like the network uh, towers, everything. Huawei can actually build all of that. So that's why one of the reasons. The second reason is China does give, uh, the Chinese government does give a lot of compensation to Huawei so they get a lot of like uh, low interest loans. So like that allows them to expand without actually thinking about costs. So that's one part of it. And Huawei is also like, uh, and the problem with the, I guess it's kind of like 
the problem with how Huawei in some ways is the fact that uh, it doesn't uh, make it as interoperable. So what that means is like, if you're using a technology from Huawei sometimes, and it's part of your 5G network, can you put Nokia and Ericsson in it? And maybe not. So I think those are some of the issues. And I think from an internet freedom perspective, we want the internet to be free, open, but at the same time, we need it to be interoperable, which means that every different connection can talk to each other so that the guidelines, the protocols are the same. So I think that's where like the question comes from uh, the Citizen Lab report is about what does it mean? So, and at the same time, they do talk about the fact that it's not only about targeting Huawei, it's about the fact that Canada does need a better robust internet system in terms of figuring out how, what to do about 5G here. But in the US, I think uh, it's a very similar concern because there are very few companies who can actually build 5G. And so with uh, Nokia and Ericsson who are doing it, but I think there's like uh, the field of like comp competitiveness is also gone because there's very few companies doing it. And it is a very expensive venture. So for example, if you want to start a 5G company right now, the research, the amount of like uh, infrastructure that you need is going to be huge. So there are very few companies doing it. So I think that's always going to be a uh, bit of a challenge, especially when it comes to deploying 5G around the world, right? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that detailed information. Actually, this was, this was like a crash course in three minutes about no, 5G. No. Um, uh, well, uh, but then, you know, uh, Sita, I will say, I mean, you know, we live in such a capitalist uh, society with a monopoly sort of system, yes. you know, and everybody's trying to basically own all of it, you know, for their own selves, like, you know, uh, so I mean, it remains a matter of debate how things, you know, unfold in the future. Uh, but we are close to time, uh, Sita, uh, but I have one last question for you. Um, sure you know, how fun is your job? And what would you say to the younger, uh, you know, not just the Tibetan uh, uh, kids, but the, you know, Himalayan uh, youth, uh, you know, like if, uh, if you are to convince these youth to, you know, uh, pursue an education in computer science, what would you say? Sure. Uh, so yeah, my job has, is, I, I don't know whether I would call it fun because I guess I was just like, but it is fun. It is kind of like, I think it is very, uh, it is kind of like, I do a job that I really love and it's actually is able to contribute to the community. So in some ways it's, it doesn't feel like a job a lot of the times. It feels more like something that I'm doing for the community and as well as something that I really appreciate uh, that in the fact that I have the opportunity to do this. So I have the opportunity to work in my own community uh, to do the work that I really like, but at the same time, that really helps the community. So I think that's something that I really appreciate about my job. And and at the end of the day, I think it's all about like, can what can you contribute, right? Uh, whether it's to the global community, whether it's to your own community, right? So I think that's something that I'm able to do. So I really appreciate that aspect of my work. So it is fun if you want it in one word, right? So apart from that, I think as you were saying about technology, I think. Yes, I think uh, we need more like people to join technology. And I think there is a lot more. Uh, and I think this is, I mean, like the next few decades or like this whole century has been a technology cent uh, century, right? Uh, whatever you want to do in the future, you will have to have some technology background. Uh, unless until like, um, uh, for example, like uh, uh, you want to do any kind of work, it will have something to do with technology. So I think uh, learning computer science is always going to be give you a bit of a leg up. So whether you want to pursue this course or whether you want to do something more arts related, I, it, I don't think it makes a huge difference. But I think there is more opportunities. And especially if I'm looking at this cybersecurity field that I'm part of, uh, if you look at the global numbers, right, there is a huge lack of people working in cybersecurity. So I think there is a lot of opportunities in this field. And I mean, like if people do want to know more, they can always get in touch with Tibet Action Institute or get in touch with me directly through Tibet Action. And we, I'm happy to kind of like assist or help out if there's anything I can do. Um, you, again, <laughs> you know, I want to um, congratulate you for the recognition. Uh, you make us, you know, not just the Tibetans, but uh, you know, people from across the Himalayas uh, proud. Um, and I, I wish you good luck in your future endeavor. And um, 
we'll see you again soon. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me.